All right, good morning, Will. How are we doing? Hey, great to see you. Good to have you here. A very special welcome to those of you joining us online. Uh, also, all of our Willow locations, great to have you as well. Uh, we're in week two of a series. We obviously started a couple weeks ago that's called Read All About It. It's a journey through the Gospel of Luke, looking at everything that Jesus did, all that he taught, and really his example that we want to follow and emulate. And specifically, we're looking at the different characteristics of Jesus. And this week we're going to look at the, the wisdom of Jesus. He was such a wise teacher. Now the reason wisdom is so important is sometimes, I don't know if you have this experience, but sometimes uh, people tend to give overly simplistic solutions to very complicated questions or very complicated situations. And I don't know about you, but that always rubs me the wrong way when somebody tries to give me a very simple solution to something that's way more complex than they're giving up for. And it reminded me of, of this book. I don't know if you've ever seen this book, but there's a book that was written a number of years ago called The Worst Case, uh, Worst Case Scenario, like Survival Handbook. And so basically what this does is it walks you through a million different things that could claim your life, but if you know how to survive, it helps you out. And so it helps you with things like how to, how to land a plane if the pilot becomes incapacitated. It helps you with things like how to jump off of a motorcycle into a moving car, right? Some very, very helpful bits of information. But sometimes their solutions seem to me very overly simplistic to what I would say pretty complicated problems. Here's one of those for me. This is how to escape from a bear. <laughs> Step one, stand tall. Now, here's a challenge for me. <laughs> now, I know when you're at our North Shore location and you look on the video screen, you're thinking, that guy fills the video screen pretty well. But if you ever meet me in person, people's immediate response when they've only seen me on a screen and not seen me in person is, man, he's not as big as I thought he was. You see, I stand about five foot seven. And if I'm really standing really tall, maybe five, seven and a half, right? That's all I got. And so if I'm trying to escape from a bear, step one is stand really tall. I don't know that I can accomplish step one. But if some, by miraculous way, I accomplish step one, here's step two. Demonstrate you are not a threat. No problem. I got step two down, right? I mean, because when I stand five foot seven, I'm probably 140 pounds soaking wet. I don't really intimidate a third grader, much less a bear. And so when step two is make yourself not a threat, I'm like, man, I got this thing hands down, right? So stand tall, make sure you're not threatening. But then it says, if the bear charges you anyway, here's what you do. You do nothing until the bear knocks you off of your feet. And then you get to step three, which is punch the bear in the nose. <laughs> That's the end. <laughs> Do we need to be reminded that I can't stand very tall and I'm not very intimidating? And so step three, the, now the expectation is that I fist fight a bear. My, my assumption is I probably won't come out on the other side of that one very well, right? To me, I read that and I feel like that's a very simple solution to a very complex situation that I hope that I never find myself in, nor you never find yourself in. But I think about that principle and how often in life do we face very complex circumstances as somebody comes along very well-meaning and provides this overly simplistic, uh, overly simplistic response that not only is not helpful, but sometimes is incredibly offensive. But what I love about Jesus is when faced some very difficult questions and some very complex situations, Jesus was a master in his teaching. Because he has the ability to dispense wisdom in such a situation that's timeless wisdom. It, 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 it's, it's wisdom that can be applied in any and every type of situation. Uh, he anchors us in truth about God, which allows us to navigate any and every, even the most complicated situations. Jesus has incredible, incredible wisdom. Now, there's a lot of different places that we could talk about the wisdom of Jesus. I want to take us to a pretty peculiar spot. So if you've got a Bible, we're going to be in the book of Luke chapter 11, when Jesus teaches us a little bit about prayer, 
which is a fascinating te- uh, teaching uh, on prayer. Now, to give you a little context to where we're at in Luke chapter 11, Jesus has just taught the Lord's Prayer, which maybe we're familiar with. Sometimes it's called the Our Father, right? And so Jesus teaches his disciples and, and those who are gathered how to pray, and then immediately after doing that, he tells the most weird, peculiar, odd story, and uh, uh, there's some fascinating wisdom in it regardless. And so here it is, uh, Luke chapter 11, we're going to start at verse 5. Here's Jesus' peculiar story. He says, suppose you went to a friend's house at midnight, wanting to borrow three loaves of bread. You say to him, a friend of mine has just arrived for a visit, and I have nothing for him to eat. And suppose he calls out from his bedroom, don't bother me. The door is locked for the night. My family and I are in bed, and I can't help you. But I tell you this, though he won't do it for friendship's sake, if you keep knocking long enough, he will get up and give you whatever you need because of your shameless persistence. That's the end of the story. And so it's a pretty peculiar story, and you kind of leave yourself scratching your head going, okay, Jesus, interesting story. What are you talking about, right? And so it's kind of an interesting story. Now, the reason there's a disconnect between Jesus' story and our understanding of the story is so much of Jesus' story is grounded in some cultural understandings that would have been very familiar in the first century. So let me take us back to the first century and put yourself in the shoes of the hearers of Jesus' original story, and it sheds some light and helps us understand it in a very unique way. You see, what's going on in the story is somebody comes as a visitor to somebody's home at night. Now, that would have been a very common place in the ancient world. If you were a traveler and you were going from one city to another city, when you get to a city, there there were no necessarily hotels. There's no Marriott, there's no Hyatt, there's no Motel 6. There aren't motels to stay in. And so what do you do? It was the responsibility of the entire town to take on any guest that's traveling through the city. And so any traveler coming through, you would put them up in a room in your home for the night. You would feed them whatever needed to be done. Now, if a traveler came to your home and you weren't able to provide for them what they needed, it was not the responsibility of just that household. It was the responsibility of the entire community to make sure that traveler was safe. And so as Jesus tells the story, they'd be like, oh, yeah, 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 that happened last Tuesday. That, That makes sense that somebody was coming through. Now, if you didn't have what you needed to take care of that particular person, what would you do? You would go to your neighbor and you would ask for help. It would be the cultural expectation that neighbor would help you out. Make some sense? And so that's what's happening in the story. This traveler comes through. There are no hotels. There are no golden arches. If there is a Chick-fil-A, it is closed on Sunday. He needs some help. And so he shows up the person's house that he shows up, he doesn't have what he needs, and so that person goes to a neighbor. He knocks on the door and basically says, a traveler's come in, I need some help, can you provide some loaves of bread? And what happens is, there's a cranky neighbor on the other side of that door. And the cranky neighbor says, I'm already in bed for the night. My kids are already down. Go away. Like, what are, what are you doing? Now, Jesus' original hearers would have heard that, and they would have been like, that's not right. That's not what we do. That would have been an obnoxious reaction in Jesus' culture. And so what happens? The guy who's knocking just keeps knocking, right? And it's not obnoxious for the guy that's knocking. It's, it's obnoxious the guy's unwilling to respond. And so Jesus says, though he wouldn't do it because it was expected of him, if you just keep him being shamelessly persistent, eventually He will do what he's expected to do. In other words, the person's being shamelessly persistent because somebody else is being shamelessly resistant. Now, we understand shameless persistence. Uh, I I remember years ago I was traveling, and I don't know about you, but but some of us were were meticulously planners, and for others of us, we kind of fly by the seat of our pants. This is always kind of a fun exercise. How many of you love to plan? When you go on vacation, you love to plan every single detail. How many of you like to wing it, right? Um, it's, it's like 50-50. It's fascinating. In my household, it's 50-50. I'm the planner. I like every detail to be laid, laid out. Uh, my wife is way more spontaneous, which probably means she's way more fun than I am. Uh, but, but I tend to be a person who plans out every little detail. And there was a time that I was traveling. I was getting to the particular city pretty late at night, and I knew that. And I roll up to the hotel that I had a reservation for. I showed the person my reservation, and she says, oh, 
we gave your room away. Like, what do you mean you gave my room away? She said, well, we didn't think you were coming, so we gave your room away. And I said, okay, no problem, just give me another room. She goes, we don't have any other rooms. Now, I don't know if you've ever been in a situation like this, but I've become shamelessly persistent pretty quick. Like, what do you mean you don't have any other room? There's, there's got to be another room. I, if you need me to go and tell somebody that they actually no longer have a room so that I can have a room, like, I'm okay with that. You know, or, or, or can you book me at the neighboring hotel? Or, you know, you come up with all kinds of options. When I realized that this person was not able to do what I needed them to do, what's my immediate reaction? Can I speak to your manager, please, right? Because I want to have a conversation with somebody who can actually do something, who can make a decision. Is your presidential suite available? Maybe I need to stay there for the night. Now, they eventually got it all figured out, but we find ourselves certain moments when, when we have to be shamelessly persistent because somebody else is being shamelessly resistant. And that's what's going on in Jesus' story. Now, it's kind of an intriguing intriguing story. What in the world is Jesus trying to communicate to us when he's trying to tell us the story, particularly when he's trying to teach us about prayer? Is he saying that God is like a cranky neighbor that, that doesn't really want to help? Is he saying that God has a heart of resistance when he's asked for something? He doesn't really want to respond Is he saying that we have to be so shamelessly persistent, twisting God's arm in every possible way just to get God to do kind of the bare minimum? That is not Jesus' teaching. You know, many times when you look at a story or a parable that Jesus tells, you look for the character in the story that represents God, and it's that character that teaches us some sort of attribute, some sort of characteristic, something about about who God is. This is not one of those parables. I would call this a parable of contrast. In other words, you find the person in the story that is doing the exact opposite of who God really is. The point of Jesus' story is that God is not a cranky neighbor. Instead, God is actually a loving father. God is not one who has great resistance. God is a loving father that wants to respond to the needs of particularly of those that he deeply loves. That's why the very next verse in the passage says this. He says, and so I tell you, keep on asking, and you'll receive what you ask for. Keep on seeking, and you will find. Keep on knocking, and the door will be open to you. For everyone who asks receives. If for everyone who seeks finds, and everyone who knocks, the door will be open." That's the very next thing that Jesus said. He said, God is not a cranky neighbor. God is a loving father. And so ask and keep on asking and you'll receive. Seek and keep on seeking and you will find. Knock and keep on knocking and that door will be open to you. That is the heart and the character of our great God. God is a loving father that wants to respond, that wants to do good, that wants to do good in your life. That's who God is. So ask and it will be given. Seek and you will find knock and the door will be open. Now, on one hand, I'm really inspired when I read these words about Jesus and in understanding God through this lens. In another way, in my most candid moments, I think that there are moments that it hasn't felt like that, right? Because there have been moments along the way that I feel like I have asked and I didn't receive. I did seek and I didn't find. I did knock and it felt like the door got slammed in my face. Have you ever had those moments spiritually? It reminds me of this. Some of you know that, that, that I'm a runner. And, and any of you that are runners, you know that if you run long enough, you know, in whatever community you live in, eventually you'll get to an intersection that's a major intersection. And when you get to that major intersection, there are crosswalks that are designed for pedestrians that, that, that really are designed to make sure that, that you can navigate the traffic well. And when you get to that intersection, inevitably you look across the, the street to where you want to go, and what do you see? You get the red hand in your face that tells you, do not, do not walk across right now. And oftentimes there's a button on a pole somewhere that you press the button, letting the intersection know that I am here in order to ignite some sort of system that will eventually turn that red hand into the stick figure walking guy. You with me? Now what happens sometimes when you get to those intersections, sometimes I hit the button and it's almost immediate the response. 
It's almost like the moment that I hit the button, the light turns yellow for the other way of traffic, and immediately it turns red for them, and it goes from the, the red hand stop to the, to the stick figure walking almost instantaneously. It's miraculous. The, the sea has parted. I get to walk upon dry crosswalk, right? It's like this, this, this miraculous moment. There are other times I get to the same intersection. I press the button, and nothing happens. And then I wait like a couple more minutes, and I press it again, and nothing happens. And there's moments that I keep pressing it over and over again, and I wonder, is this button really connected to anything? Like, is this one of those things that they put this here to make me feel like it's going to respond to me in some ways, but really it's just going to do whatever it wants, whenever it wants, however it wants. It'll eventually get to me maybe, but I'm not really sure, right? And sometimes like, I wonder, is this button connected to anything? And sometimes... In my most difficult moments, I ask the same hard questions about prayer, and is it really connecting? I mean, there are moments, prayerfully speaking, where I ask God for something, and again, it's the same way that almost instantaneously, miraculously, God moves in such a powerful way in my life or the lives of those around me. It's amazing. And then there's other times that I pray that it feels like there's just this disconnect, that I wonder... Is this prayer attached to anything? Is God really hearing it? Is God really caring about it? Is God really willing to respond to it? It just feels like it's so disconnected. Have you ever been there? If you've ever been there, that's why this parable matters so much. You see, when Jesus teaches about prayer, the greatest wisdom that Jesus gives us is not a particular formula that we pray in some way to convince God to give us what we want. When Jesus teaches us about prayer, what he's more interested in is give us the wisdom about the character of who God is. Because if we can understand who God is, it causes us to see our situation and see our circumstances a little bit different. Because the truth is, if I'm not careful, I will allow the truth about a situation dictate what I believe about God. But Jesus says, don't allow that to happen. Instead, allow your life to be anchored in the truth about God and allow the truth about God to dictate what you believe about a circumstance or situation. What Jesus says is, anchor your life in this truth that God is a good God. He is a loving Father. He wants to do good in your life. Is so don't let the truth about a circumstance dictate your belief about God. Instead, allow the truth about God that He is a good God who wants good in your life. Allow that to dictate what you believe about a situation. Because if you're willing to anchor your life in the wisdom of God's truth, it changes how we see our circumstances. Because Jesus says, Ask and it'll be given to you, seek and you will find, knock and the door will be opened. But what happens when it doesn't open? And Jesus, in his wisdom, even shares with you a little bit more about why sometimes God says no. Here's the very next verse. He says, you fathers, if your children ask for a fish, do you give them a snake instead? Or if they ask for an egg, do you give them a scorpion? Of course not. So if you sinful people know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Now, now don't be put off by where Jesus calls us sinful people. There's other translations that say, you who are evil. And this is not Jesus being offensive. It's not Jesus name-calling. He's basically just acknowledging the fact that, that you are a human, and I am a human, and we don't always get things right, right? You know, we, we can mess things up. We're, we're prone to mistakes. We're prone to do things that are not even what God desires to do. But even in our mistake-ridden experiences, even when we go off base and when we don't get it right, even though that's true about us, good fathers know how to give good gifts to their kids. Now, I know that there's some exceptions to that where there are fathers that have done tremendous harmful things to children, but by and large, even mistake-ridden fathers, they know how to give good gifts to their kids, right? And so what kind of father that if If a kid asked for an egg, meaning like some sort of provision or food, would give them a scorpion something that's painful. Like a good father wouldn't do that. 
If a kid was asking for something good, a good father is not going to give them something painful in response. It reminds me of, of, of this. Uh, I don't know if you've ever seen these, but this is a sucker. And if you looked real close, can you see what's inside of the sucker? In this particular sucker, it's a cricket. They do make, they do make suckers with scorpions, but I tried to find those on Amazon. And could you believe they were sold out this week on Amazon? I don't know who else is buying scorpion uh, suckers except for me when I'm trying to speak on this particular message, but, but nevertheless, there still are suckers with some pretty disgusting things inside. And so just imagine that, 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 a, that a child was asking for something good. Dad, can I have a strawberry sucker? Sure, kid. And I gave them a strawberry sucker with something inside that's not quite so good. And basically what Jesus is saying is God would never do that. God would never give you a scorpion, even if you asked for it, because he's a good God, and he wants to bring good in your life. Now, candidly, as a pastor, that I've been, I've been a pastor for over 20 years, and there are lots of moments that people have prayed for certain things, that it appears as though God has responded with a no and candidly speaking, I don't understand why. There, there are times that I just don't know why God does what he does. It doesn't make sense. But the more I grow in my relationship with the Lord, and the, the, the more I begin to lean into his wisdom, there are a lot of situations that his no's start making a little bit more sense. I can't explain every circumstance, but there are there are certain aspects of wisdom based on this passage that start to make some sense. And so years ago, I saw this framework. I'm not really sure where I got this framework. I, I, I'm not the one that came up with this, but I found it to be really, really helpful in understanding why sometimes God says no. I want to give you three pieces that hopefully be helpful to you in your journey. Hey, here's the first one. If, if the ask is not right, God says no. Like if what I'm asking for is not the right thing to ask for, oftentimes God will say no. Again, if, if we ask for a scorpion, God is not going to give you a scorpion because God's a good God. He's not going to give you something that would bring pain in your life. I mean, think about it this week. This week in my own household, uh, I've got two boys. They're both in junior high. One of my sons came up to me and he asked me for something and I knew his heart. I knew his intention. He thought he was asking for something that he thought was good for him. Now, being a little bit older, hopefully a little bit more mature and a little bit wiser and further along in my years, I knew what he was asking for, and I understood his heart in asking for it, but I know more about what he was asking for, and I believe that it had a greater chance to cause him harm than it did bring him good in his life. And so as a good father, I told him, no, I'm not going to do it. He was furious with me about it. He could not believe that I would, I would deny his request for this thing that he was wanting. He just couldn't believe it. And it didn't matter how angry he got with me. It didn't matter how frustrated he got with me. I'm not going to give my son something that I think has the chance of causing him great pain in his life. And whether he was able to see her or not, I realized that the ask that he was making was not the right ask. And so I told him no. And I think about, as I look back over my shoulder, my own journey, I think about the, the myriad of things along the way that I asked for with a good heart and with a good intention. At the time, I thought I was asking for something good, and it was only much later in life that I discovered that God had something very different that would bring much greater good in my life. And so it was a no in the moment for a greater yes down the line. And the beauty about God is sometimes God says no because what we're asking for is a scorpion, even if we don't even know it's a scorpion. And God will never give you a scorpion, even if you're asking for it. And so sometimes, when the ask is right, not right, God says no. But sometimes, if the timing is not right, God says slow. Now, I would say there's a, there's a big difference between no and not yet, right? There's, there's a big difference between just an out and out, no, it's not going to happen, and it's not a bad request, it's just that the timing's not right. 
And I would say a right request with the wrong timing is actually still the wrong thing to say yes to. And so it's not a no, but it's a, it's a slow. So for example, if my son came to me today and said, Dad, can I borrow the car? That's a not yet, because you're 14. But in a couple of years, that same request, there are going to be moments where I'll likely be able to say yes. And so it's not a no, it's just a not yet, because the timing's not right. And there are lots of times in life that we're petitioning God, we're asking God for something, but for whatever reason, the timing's not right. And if the timing's not right, God's not going to give us something that we're not quite ready to handle. And so when the timing's not right, God says, slow. And will you and I trust that we have a good God who wants good in our life, that sometimes slow is the right answer? So when the request is not right, God says no. When the timing is not right, God says slow. When I am not right, God says grow. When I am not right, God says grow. Now what's interesting in my own prayer life, my own prayer journey, I look back over my shoulder and and I realize for many, many years, if you just looked at the things that I was praying for consistently... I would pray that God would change the circumstance, and we should pray for those types of things. I would pray that God would change the heart of another person. Sometimes I would pray that God would smite somebody if they were messing with me, right? That I would pray that God would change anything and everything around me. But you know what I, what I didn't often pray for? Is that God would actually change me. I wanted God to change everything around me. But it's very rare that I was asking God to change me. And what's interesting is God is very interested in the transformation of my own heart in my own life. I wasn't frequently enough praying, God, would you give me patience when I don't feel like I have any? God, would you help me forgive somebody who's wounded me? God, would you make me more generous in responding to the needs around me? Far too often, I was just praying that God would change everything outside of me, but I wasn't asking God to actually change me. I wonder what would happen if you and I took up the call to say, there are times that God says, grow, because I'm not right. Because my heart's not right in a situation, because I'm not responding in an appropriate way, that I'm not reacting to a particular situation the way that God has to me. And so, When I'm asking God to change a situation or change a person, God says no because God wants me to grow. And sometimes that's that's God's response. That when the request is not right, God says no. When the timing is not right, God says slow. When I am not right, God says grow. But the wisdom that Jesus gives us in prayer is is mind-boggling, but it's all connected to the heart and the character of our great God. The question becomes, in any and all circumstances, do I believe that God is a cranky neighbor, or do I trust Him as a loving Father? And Jesus says, if you're willing to trust Him as a loving Father that loves you, that cares for you, who believes intimately in you, that God wants the best in your journey, if we fundamentally believe that, That I won't let the truth about a situation dictate my belief in God. Instead, I will allow the truth about God dictate how I see any and every circumstance. And that causes me to want to lean into the heart of God. Trust Him with every aspect of my life. Come to Him prayerfully in any and every situation. I want to encourage all of us at all of our locations to take a next step regarding prayer. Uh, As we mentioned last week, uh, throughout this series, we're asking everybody to read along with us in the book of Luke, that we want to take a chapter a day and just as an entire church read through the book of Luke. Can I add something to that today? Uh, Would you you commit to also uh, to pray through the book of Luke? So I want to ask you right now at all of our locations, also here at South Barrington, to go ahead and get out a a phone or, or smart device. Does everybody have one of those with you? Go ahead and get it out. I know that, that we're told to like put those away in church and silence them. How about let's get them out and, and, and let's use them in the service. Uh, we've got a prayer experience designed for you that will send you a prayer prompt every day for the next 21 days between now and Easter. As we think about the, the next 21 days between now and Easter, we believe in a God who wants to bring good in your life. 
As we prepare our hearts for Easter, we believe in a God who wants to bring good in and through this church. We believe in a God who wants to bring good in and through your family, in and through the world. Would, you, would, would we as a church commit our lives to pray for the next 21 days together? So you're going to see a prayer prompt. If you just take out your phone and you text the word 21 days to the number 25377. Literally, you can do it in this moment. Uh, you can also go to willowcreek.org slash Luke. There's a lot of other resources that are available to you. And again, for the next 21 days, you're going to get a simple prayer prompt. Some of the prompts are asking you to pray for the church. Some are asking you to pray for your family and friends. Some are asking you to pray for yourself. Will you lean in to the truth about God, that he's a good God who wants to do good things? And together, let's watch God do some supernatural things in the mist over the next 21 days. You in? We in? All right. I think they're in all the way in Huntley and North Shore, Chicago, Wheaton, South Lake, Crystal Lake. Who have I forgotten? We're all in together, right? We're all in together. For the next 21 days, we're going to be prayerful together. Next up, number two. At all of our locations, we're pumped about Easter. It's 21 days from now. And we're pumped about uh, the different experiences. Every one of our campuses has a Good Friday experience. Every one of our campuses have powerful Easter experiences that are planned. To learn more about all those times, go to willowcreek.org slash Easter. You can learn all the times at all of our locations. You don't want to miss Easter this year. Here's the last piece, third next step. For some of you, at all of our locations, for some of you, you are actually the focus and have been the focus of other people's prayers for a long time. And you probably don't even know it. There's a parent or a spouse or a friend that loves you like crazy and has been praying that God would do something special in your life. And I can't close out our time together without at least giving you the opportunity to respond to the goodness and the grace and the love of our great God. For some of you, this very moment could be an answer to a prayer that somebody's been praying for you for a long time. And I want to give you the opportunity to say yes to Jesus, to, to turn your life over to him, to fully surrender your life to him. You know, earlier in all of our services, we watched, you know, people getting baptized. That's that public profession of this inward commitment to follow Jesus. And if you've not yet made the decision to follow Jesus, don't wait. You got a good father that is crazy about you, that wants to bring good in your life. If you allow me to, I'm just going to say a prayer. And if you want to yield your life to Jesus, would you just, would you just pray with me? You don't even have to pray out loud. You can just simply, in, just in, in, in the context of your own heart, just silently pray the same prayer to God. Surrender your life fully to him. Let's go to God in prayer. God, we love you. God, we say thank you for your son, Jesus. God, we thank you for your, his death, his burial, his ultimate resurrection that gives us the opportunity to live a new life. God, thanks for the infinite wisdom of Jesus. Father, we believe that you're a good father. You're not a cranky neighbor. You're a good, good father who wants to do good in our lives. And Father, for some of us, for the very first time, we yield our lives to you. God, we surrender to you. We commit our life to follow your son, Jesus. God, would you work in our life would you move in our heart? Would you help us take the next step in following you? We pray that in Jesus' name. Amen.